welcome to the Wiggly Podcast. It's 181. It's a glorious day. I'm Heather from Wiggly Wigglers and my partner in crime today is... Richard, also uh, occasionally of Wiggly Wigglers. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just, from... so it's just you and I today or...? Well, we've got a special coming up, Rich, because Farmer Phil and I have been off today, May Day, recording the moment the cows go out to pasture. Ah, right. So that's earlier this morning, and while you and I are speaking, Farmer Phil is loading the cows up into the wagon. Yeah. Rolling, rolling, yeah, I can hear, I mean, I think they're listening, probably catch the sound of uh, calves and cows in the background. And then the lorry is winging its way down the road, I suppose 10 miles, over the border between here and Wales, so over that brook, to Lanfihangle, Crew Corny, where the cattle will go out on that glorious hillside with a panoramic view. They can see the skirid if they want to, and they can see the whole of Abergavenny, and it is wonderful. Fantastic. Well, that's much better than going to the other side of the country, isn't it? Or, you know, even going down to France or something like that. At least they get to grow up in a place that's, that's local, familiar to them almost. If I was going to grow up, I'd like to grow up there. Yeah. Uh, of course, there is a if two... going to grow up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, right. there is a two million pound house on the property. Right. Which isn't mine. Oh, that's a shame. No. Is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> but anyway, and uh, 23 pigs, I think. They've got a community pig project down there. Right. He's causing Farmer Phil a little bit of strife because... Of the pigs excavating his fields. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of pigs have they got? Are they rare breeds? Or uh, they've got all sorts down there. Community pig project. Right. It's a bit odd because about 23 families look after pigs. I see. Quite, uh, OK. So they have a pig per family, a bit well, like... Oh, yeah, a, sort of. olden day kind of sentiment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. OK, let's go to our cow special spring 2009 recorded this day, 1st of May. Excitement. Penguin is uh, entirely enthusiastic this morning because we're turning the first batch of cows and calves out to grass. Right? And they know stuff's going on, you can tell. And they're giving Rob the run around as well. That's an interesting stick that Rob has got. That's the latest in technology for guidance, that is. It looks like a piece of old Cathine pipe. That's what it would be, but it's good because they don't Don't use it to hit them. You use it as a extension of your arm. Right. And so... And that's, that's Penguin proclaiming to all and sundry oh. who's prepared to listen that he is, in fact, in charge. He's frolicking. He is. He's quite a frolicsome <laughs> individual. He For those of you, obviously, who aren't here watching this, Penguin is breathing heavily like this, snort, snort, and he's jumping up with his one hind leg in a sort of skippy fashion, which for a half-ton monster, oh, near a, ton. a ton monster, doesn't quite... Oh, here he goes again, skippity doo dah <laughs> hey, oh. He'll pause now, going past the other cattle yards, <laughs> to see if he can wind up whoever's in them. Right. His, his ideal is if there's another bull in there, yeah. so that he'll stick his head over oh, the door. Oh, he's kicked the door. <laughs> yeah, he he'd do all that. <laughs> The idea is to wind up anything that is near him. Right, now he's got his head in the hay and he's sort of rubbing yeah. himself. Well, of course, the other thing is they're just changing their coats. So they're getting rid of their winter coat and growing a nice, sleek summer coat, and that makes them itchy. So any opportunity to scratch themselves is usually taken. Oh, yeah. Here he is, look. And so now he is in the process of destroying my draft excluder. Oh, yes. He's down now on his knees... Pummeling at the door. We'll move on to something else now, he thinks, because a lot of it is herd instinct, so that he's protecting his group of cows. And some bulls will get very... They, they won't let you take them out of the shed and things like that. They'll guard the doorway. It, it's quite interesting. It's the relationship between their character and their instincts. But what will happen to them now? Because Farmer Phil, the field, is over 
on my left and the cows are going to my right. Ah, well, it's complex management uh, of Lerner Lake near... They're going the, on a trip-off. They're off. going on a trip-off to the farm in Wales, right. where the majority of our grass is. There will be some here, and perhaps later on, if we have time, we'll turn some out here as well. But these ones are going to spend the summer down at Campston, which is 25 miles away, where Chris will look after them, and that's where most of our grazing grass is. Now, Farmer Paula on Twitter, at Farmer Paula on Twitter... She's got nice red ruby devons. She is in Devon, and she let her cows out two days ago. That's right. Well, the only reason we haven't is because we had to coordinate a lorry to take them to Campston. Yeah. And also we're trying to drill peas and mix bird seed and all the rest of it. it. It's not that ours couldn't have gone out, although the weather yesterday was not very pleasant for them. What we try and do is to avoid turning them out into cold, wet conditions because they've spent all winter in the shed. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about because, you know, you've told me many times that there's no such thing as intensive cattle farming in the UK, you know, and you've mentioned... I'm not um, sure I said that, but I... Well, feedlots are not... Ah, yes, no, we don't do ...are not the done thing, where you you sort of have thousands of cattle in a small space. Mm. But when all's said and done, when these cattle have been in here for six months Mm. in this shed, Mm. and so... Is that really much of a lot? Oh, no. Oh, no. What's happening now? Well, now Rob's moving around one of the other lots <laughs> to separate out some more to turn out. Right, let's go and sit on the chair. I don't think that it's a question of intensity. The reason that they spend time in the shed is so that they're not out in the mud and wet in the winter. I mean, we're in a region that has 38 inches of rain a year. Yeah, 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 maybe. But with the best will in the world, I'm looking at a muddy shed and I'm not sure that I would want to live in there. You know, how much space have they actually got? Um, I forget what the exact figure is, but I, there is a figure and our sheds exceed it. There is an optimum figure. And, and we have more than that amount. But and do you think as time goes on that this sort of farming will remain acceptable? Is it acceptable in your heart? Yeah, I'm completely happy with the, the regime that we offer. Right, go and whack them and shut them up now. <laughs> no, you won't, quiet, you won't let them go quiet now. They have decided that they're going to make a racket now. The, the obvious thing is that we've got this one bunch of cattle behind us in the paddock. They yeah. have the option to go into the shed or be out in the field. Yeah. Every night they're in the shed, all of them, without yeah. exception. So the, they prefer to be there out of the weather. If you have them outside in bad weather, all they do is stand around underneath the shed looking miserable. Yeah. And, all right, you say you wouldn't like to live in the cow shed. You're not a cow. But if I told you the option... Thank you, Farmer Phil. The option was to go and lie out on some cold, wet grass out in the field, you'd probably take the option of some straw in the shed. Yeah, I suppose so. But, I mean, you know, pe- people would say, if they came and had a look, oh, it'd be better for them to be outside. But, you see, this cattle yard has got full sunshine, hasn't it? Yeah, well, this so cattle, cattle yard is... have had sunshine. Yeah, but, I mean, with, this was a yard that we put up specifically with that in mind. The idea was to give them as much fresh air as possible without exposing them to the elements. And to a very large extent, it's been very successful. It takes a hell of a storm to get significant weather into the shed. They do get a good amount of fresh air and we don't get pneumonia in them as a result. And you're dead right that the design of the shed is critical when it comes to actually avoiding disease problems and management problems but with regard to shed versus outside in the winter you've seen cattle being outwintered and the farmer has to carry food to them out in the field and they're up to their guts in mud trying to get to the food however he's got it there there's no it's a no-brainer in my view and what about the emotions because i'm going to send farmer phil dear listener with the recorder for the moment he lets them out of the lorry to fresh 
green pasture out on a Welsh hillside. I don't know if they appreciate the view, but it is absolutely stunning where they're going. What about their emotions? Have they got emotions? Can we put that onto them? Or does that make us right soppy? Because after all, we're going to eat them. It's difficult to know whether they appreciate the view. I know they appreciate things like sunshine and the warmth on their back, and they appreciate nice green grass and a nice firm field underneath. Horses, I am convinced, will stand and look at the view for ages. I, I know that they like the view. I think the cattle probably don't have that level of appreciation, but, you know, at the same time, it is a nice place down there, except when the rain's coming at you <laughs> yeah. horizontally, but on a sunny morning like this morning, it's glorious. Now, we just walked into our round top yard, and we seem to have got a bull that looks the spitting image of John McQuirick. <laughs> well, I think that's probably a bit harsh on Nabob, really. I think uh, he's considered... That is John McQuirick. He is considerably For those of you who don't know, John McQuirick commentates on... No, what's he doing? He's a, a commentator on racing and a betting expert. In fact, I'll take a picture of John McQuirick the bull so you can make up your own mind. This is Nabob, our senior stock bull. Right. And the reason that he's still inside here is because we will keep him here this summer, or at least to start with, for the cattle that are going out here. The other two bulls will deal with them down at Campston. So are those bulls going to get a bit of a rip-roaring time today? Well, they've been, they've been in with their cows since the 23rd of March. I know, so. but can they actually have such a good time in such... Well, limited penguin, situation. Uh, penguin. Are they embarrassed? No. Well, <laughs> that's an interesting point because sometimes you will get bulls who you never see working. Right. And, so and by working you mean um, yeah, on the job. Yeah. But I think that if you ask Penguin, which he'd prefer, looking at his personality and his attitude, I think he prefers the cattle yard because they're <laughs> captive. They can't get away from him. But... <laughs> No, I mean, in many ways, out in the field is preferable. Um, you know, they don't, you, you don't run the risk of them trampling on calves and injuring themselves so much and all that sort of thing. And so. you know I used to be a sheep farmer. Absolutely. So what we did was we put a rattle, so a coloured bit of ink, on the ram's belly, and that meant that when he had... Oh, this is embarrassing, isn't it? When he had um, um, had a bit of rumpty pumpty, he left a bit of the ink on the, the ewe's bum. So do you do the same thing with uh, no, bulls? No, we don't do that. What we tend to do is to pregnancy test them a period of time after the bulls have been in with them. The earliest, really, that it's sensible to do it is two months because you can only sensibly detect a pregnancy once it's six weeks old. So the earliest would be two months. We tend to go a bit later than that. We'll have gone through the cattle to make sure that they're all clean and healthy so that there are no issues post-calving, so that any, any problems with infections or problems in that department are sorted out prior to the bull going into them so that hopefully we've caught anything like that. And thereafter, it's just a case of uh, pregnancy testing to find out which ones are in calf. We might at that point make another decision as to why an animal hasn't got in calf or whether there's a problem with it and treat it accordingly. What's a decent bull making this year, Phil, price-wise? A, a decent anything is making a lot of money. A, a new, a young stock bull, people are paying upwards of £3,000 a go for them. Well, well done to Clivey and John in the village yeah, well, for getting the reserve champion 3,100 guineas at Worcester Market. That's right, and we should just say a guinea is a pound and five pence. And Lord knows why they still use it. I don't know, but it's, it's just tradition. to confuse you. But Nabob is our senior bull. He's 12 this year, so which is old for a bull. And as you can see, he's totally unfussed by what's going on around him. He takes the view that he knows he'll get his action in due course. And um, how much are you selling your cows for? Is, is this the moment? You know, if you... Well, we've just sent the later carved calves up to Will's um, last week, so I don't know exactly what price we'll get for them, but the price for store cattle at the moment is very good, as good as it's been for a long time. How do you explain that? Shortage, basically. Shortage Short of the, beef? Shortage of beef. But people have got freezers. 
that there's a worldwide shortage of animal protein, meat protein, and that puts the price up. Effectively, it reduces imports into this country. That that's the the upshot of it. Well, I'll be. A good news story on May Day from Lower Blakemere Farm, where the cattle are going out to play. Now, an interesting thing, when they go out to play, one of the things we have to be careful of is not only about the weather, because it is quite a stressful time. Although they enjoy it, it is stressful to them. And we can run into problems. Why is it stressful? It's well, great. Well, because it's a big change for them. Right. We've been feeding them meal. I see. Now, normally, I would not... You know, continue feeding the meal out in the field but I think this year we're going to give them a little bit out in the field to make the transition a little bit less of a shock to their system because to go from dry food in the yard to fresh green grass it's quite a... Ah, it's like me thing. going on holiday to India so I go from my mm. cornflakes and muesli over to India, really hot weather and then I have a curry. Exactly. Now you know what happens there. <coughs> and much the same happens to <laughs> the cow. I see. And the result of that is that in our case, and it varies according to your soil type and all the rest of it, but we have to be very careful about trace elements and their deficiencies and notably in our case magnesium. Because if an animal gets deficient in magnesium because the grass is rushing through its system, it's fresh green grass, it hasn't got very much magnesium in it, the result is that one day you'll have a perfectly healthy looking animal and then all of a sudden it'll fall on the floor and start thrashing about and you've got about five minutes before it's dead. Now, in true James Herriot style, if you see one doing that and you, we carry a bottle of magnesium for just such a purpose and you can get magnesium into it, it will get up and walk off completely normally. If you fail, it dies. So obviously you can't be sat there watching for it, so what we do is add magnesium to the water. It's metered into the water in their water trough so they all get some. So that, that's how we overcome that, but it used to be, it was a condition known as staggers, because that's what they do, is stagger about and fall over, and then they just thrash. And they've had more magnesium in the shed than they did out? Or? Well, in the shed, where they're feeding meal, we can feed them minerals mixed with the meal, so they all get minerals. But obviously, once they go out at grass, once they're not having any meal, they're not getting the, the mineral additives. And I'm not a big fan of free ad-lib minerals because I think that a few animals eat all the minerals and some of the animals might not get any at all. So that methods of getting things like magnesium into them so they all get some, so water is by far the best because they've all got a drink and it's metered into it so you can relatively accurately give them the right amount. Going on holiday it makes me think of health and beauty, you know, and maintenance. So in a cow's life, is there much maintenance like manicure? It's, again, it's quite an individual thing. Some cows you'll never need to touch their feet at all and other cows they won't regulate at all and you have to trim them and we use a thing like a giant set of nail clippers and that's essentially what you do you, you cut the excess horn off and get the foot back to shape hopefully so that they're stood square on the ground so yep yeah, so you just that. look out for growing nails. yeah yeah you keep keep an eye out for cattle we've got one or two you know now over the next couple of months once they're out we'll go and collect them in we've got to blue tongue vaccinate them within the next month and it's an ongoing thing it's the sort of thing that you get them in you think oh i'll just trim up that one haircuts haircut no they they change their coats twice a year the only haircut you do have to cut the ends off their tails right because their tails will grow indefinitely and obviously if their tails get very dirty they get very heavy so then when they are relieving themselves if they are <laughs> unable to get the tail out of the way the whole thing gets all dirty and claggy and horrible and they don't tend to get maggots like a sheep but what does happen with the cows is that if they get the udder very dirty then there is a, it attracts flies and you can run into mastitis problems you're so earthy aren't you well, it's dentistry it is, isn't it? dentistry dentistry is not a huge problem until you get into the older cattle when they just start to plain lose their teeth uh, as they get older they lose particularly their front teeth so that they struggle with short grass they can't eat short grass and they might also struggle chewing up hard food so that you know you have to be a little bit careful that as as some of these cattle get older they, they to some extent they naturally don't carry as much condition when they get older a lot of them they, you know they, they tend to 
get thinner but you have to be more careful with them and that quite honest was where we ran into some problems this winter those cattle are the vulnerable ones so that if I don't get the feeding regime quite right they are the ones most susceptible they'll be the first ones to suffer because they don't carry any surplus on that note either I can go for implants now or dentures so I thought to save putting my teeth out by the bedroom in the glass that perhaps implants were the best investment possibly (laughs) you wouldn't want to be frightening me of an (laughs) evening would we there Hmm. we are let's go and load them up in the lorry righto Right, last pen of the lorry. The whole lorry, which is a articulated double decker, although we only use the bottom deck for cattle, is divided up into pens. So we have no more than five, maybe six cows in any pen. So that while they're travelling, there's no risk of them hurting themselves. And each pen is divided by solid aluminium gates so that once they're in they're quite tightly packed so they can't move around and then they'll travel happily and get there without injuring themselves at all so that's 21 cows on a load and we've got the calves in the trailer and we will set off towards Campston to show them what grass is about again Well, we've reached Campston now and we've reunited the calves with their mothers and they're just setting off at a brisk canter to a gorgeous green field overlooking the Skirid and looking out across the Black Mountains at Wales. And uh, the calves, of course, who've never been outside before, are galloping around in this totally newfound wonderland. The cows, the younger ones, are sort of trotting about and kicking up their heels. The older ones who've seen it all before head straight down and get the first mouthful of that fresh spring growth. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of mooing. Adin's got his ears pricked. He's looking forward to the summer. There's a little bit of calves trying to find their mothers because we travel them separately to make sure the calves don't get hurt so they go in the in the stock trailer behind the truck to keep them out of harm's way they'll set off now and they're disappearing to the far extremity of the field particularly the calves they're jostling with each other chasing each other and cantering about to them it's their first ex- real experience of a wide open space and they find that very exciting and so there we are first load out we'll go and get another one now then rich yep we need to know the latest review okay well, i've got it in front of me if i can read it so through the glare of your little macbook here it says top podcast macbook air okay <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Sorry, what a mistake. <laughs> so, after this boy. Quite. <laughs> okay, so what's the difference, Ev? About £400. <laughs> Blimey. <laughs> Blimey. Anyway, Come on, what's okay. it say? Milka Plus Plus Five Star Review. And this is, uh, this is from Christina from Alton. And Christina says, top podcast, I love it. Definitely a Milka plus plus. In a world obsessed by commercialism, consumerism, non-celebrities and so much other nonsense, it's an absolute joy to hear from funny, intelligent, articulate, proper people. And you. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Discussing, laughing and arguing about the things that really matter. As a refugee from the southeast, five and a half years ago, Hertfordshire to glorious Herefordshire, only one letter difference but a world apart in brackets, the podcast is a real education for a former townie and delivered with such humour, commitment and passion by people who obviously care about farming, countryside and the environment. I first heard about the podcast when Richard gave a talk to our local gardening club and I'm working my way through the archives on number 42 at the moment. Well, well done, Christina, you've got a few to go yet then. (laughs) As well as listening to the, the current ones each week. There's not many things that can make me cry with laughter, but the Wiggly podcast is right up there. It's a real treat. 
Listen once, I guarantee it'll have you hooked. There you are. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Christina. Now, um, we had a lot of feedback on um, Farmer Phil's streaker moment. Yeah? Yeah. Well, um, somebody, well, June Saddington put on Facebook a warning not to listen to it. <laughs> and it was all about doing the conga, etc. And Farmer Phil hasn't spoken about it since. No. Doing the conga. <laughs> on this special, special cow cast. Let's go to Monty with a Monty Cast, a weekly fact on wiggliness. The Monty Cast, a weekly fact on wiggliness. This year, the wiggly florist is sourcing its foliage from a field just 800 metres away. Another Monty Cast next week on the Wiggly Podcast. Next week, we'll be out in the Wiggly Garden checking out all my plants and flowers and tulips and frog spawn not hmm. so we'll see you then but if you want to contact us how do we get hold of you now rich part-timer bugs and beasties self-employed guru house builder oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a decent <laughs> <laughs> oh, new title I suppose it's better than the many things that you've called me in the past <laughs> well you can still have my uh, my email remains uh, <laughs> richard at wigglywigglers.co.uk so that's uh, probably the easiest one to get me on at the moment and shake that watch a bit more that'll annoy michael Ready? sorry sorry, sorry. On, yeah, I, I need to i need to stick up there you are listener <laughs> if you ever hear that that is ricardo's watch and every week michael gets his fists holds them up and shakes them when he wiggles, wiggles that the, the, watch. The nervous wrist waggle. You can contact me, heather at wigglywigglers.co.uk. Farmer Phil is pwg at lowerblakemail.co.uk, as he would be. And on Twitter, it's brilliant. Rich, you can't be on there. No. Sorry, mate. No. I'm, 140 characters. No. It's much too succinct. <laughs> You'd have only just said, i just about to tell you a small story and it's over. But Farmer Phil's on there, Farmer Phil with no E, and I'm on there at Wiggled. And in fact, we'll see next week if our guest Rachel is on Farmer Twitter. Farmer Phil needs an E. He does need an E. Live in the old boy. <laughs> Now, that's funny. In fact, Farmer Phil Witherney is in Shropshire and he doesn't Twitter much. Right. So I thought I might tweet him up. Good idea. Yeah. Bye from us. Bye-bye.